Welcome to CPT Coding Simplified for AMCI. What is CPT Coding? CPT is the acronym for Current Procedural Terminology, CPT. And the code set is a medical code set established by the American Medical Association, or AMA, and maintained annually by the CPT Editorial Panel. The CPT code set, copyright protected by the AMA, describes medical, surgical, and diagnostic services and is designed to communicate uniform information about medical services and procedures among physicians, coders, patients, accreditation organizations, and payers for administrative, financial, and analytical purposes. All right, so we're going to get right to it how to code using CPT codes. It's simple. There are three steps. Step one, we're going to look up the procedure in the index. Step two, verify the code in the chapter. And the chapter has red, blue, or green pages. Step three, confirm if the guidelines or other directives apply. It's that simple. Okay, we'll review the steps again, then we'll get coding. Step one, look for the procedure or keyword found in the index located in back of the CPT guide. Yes, a procedure is a keyword and we will discuss that a little later. Now, if you're unable to find the procedure, search for the general procedure such as application, incision and drainage, debridement, introduction, dilation, excision, exploration, biopsy, repair, etc. These are all examples of general procedures. And I'd like to say, I'd like to remind people that if you don't know what a procedure is, let's say there's a um, procedure of um, excision of foot mass. Well, let's say that you don't know what the keyword is or what the procedure is. So let's just look at all of those words independently. And whatever word appears like it's doing something or it's a procedure, then that likely is your procedure. So we have a circumstance. I gave you a scenario of excision of foot mass. So we have three words, excision, foot, mass. It can't be foot. That's not a procedure. That's a foot. Mass, that's not a procedure either. That's a mass. But excision, that's a procedure because it's actually doing something. It's actually doing some sort of action. So I would just say use your, if you, you know, the new coders and you don't really know what these procedures are, as you get started, you have to use some of these techniques to kind of help yourself out. So if you can't determine what the procedure is, what is that action word going on in that little scenario? And that is your procedure. All right, so step one, look for the procedure in the index. Also, one thing I need to tell you, common conditions such as fractures are not procedures, yet they have their own section in the CPT index. As you code more, you will become familiar with specific circumstances that fall outside the general standard of locating a procedure in the CPT manual. So yes, fractures isn't a procedure. It's actually a diagnosis that happens to have a section in the index because there's so many um, fractures and it just kind of makes sense. And the more, when you start coding, you'll see that, yeah, it does make sense to have a, a condition like fracture in a procedure section. Step two, after you've gotten your code from the index, you verify that code in the chapter preceding the index. So the chapter are the colored pages, the red, the blue, the green pages, you can verify your code there. They're listed in numeric order and according to body systems. And the more you start coding, the more you're going to start finding some things out on your own. One thing I'm going to share with you, I noticed in the surgery section, that's 10,000 
through 60,000 that the location on the body is actually the red bold and the the procedure is the blue bold and when you start chunning or if you've already chunned you may have figured that out on your own so step two verify the code in the chapter step three confirm that you have coded correctly by viewing coding guidelines modifiers and other directives that apply to the code this is probably going to be the bulk of this presentation learning a lot of those guidelines and directives it's definitely not difficult however it can be um, a bit taxing for some who don't appreciate reading so much so if you didn't like to read before coding you need to find a way to love to read because that is going to be your friend reading it and ensuring that you have all that you need all of the guidelines to code and select the proper code so step three confirm your code selection okay let's begin CPT coding I think you're ready so we're going to just go ahead and use the three steps that we've just discussed one we're going to look up the procedure in the index Two, verify the procedure code in the chapter and three we're going to confirm the procedure code by applying the notes and the directives that we have been given in the form of guidelines all right I said the, the G word and um, after we begin um, coding we're going to talk more about how to apply those directives and guidelines so let's begin okay number one patient had a radical prostatectomy pause the presentation to solve if you said 55810 you are correct so how did we get this answer well we went to the index and we looked up prostatectomy and it should have taken you to these codes and it was your job to choose the best of the codes in the series so we see prostatectomy perennial subtotal well none of that was said to us we see code um, 55810 that's a prostatectomy radical well this patient had a radical prostatectomy and that is our code so that's why we selected 55810 and if you got that correct congratulations number two what is the CPT code for total abdominal hysterectomy pause the presentation to solve if you said 58150 then you are correct so what did you do well if you looked up the code in the index and you looked up hysterectomy it would have driven you to 58150 total abdominal hysterectomy corpus and cervix that corpus and cervix means uterus and cervix now one thing I want to point out this ectomy and hysterectomy is actually excision excision also means removal so you could have actually looked up excision then uterus and it should have driven you to a series of codes around 58150 and then you had to simply look for total abdominal hysterectomy so if you got it correct excellent number three a 12 year old had a tonsillectomy pause the presentation to solve If you said 42826, 
You are correct. Now be careful. The patient is 12 years of age. And if they are younger than 12, you would have selected 42825. But actually, those codes are for patients that are 11 years old and younger. I know that 12 kind of throws people off. So if you got 42826 correct, outstanding. So that was pretty easy. Of course, there are more complex procedures, but we must understand CPT terminology, guidelines, requirements, and instructions to learn advanced coding concepts. So are you ready? Here we go. About the book. On your right, you have a picture of the CPT manual, and this is the manual that I hope all of you have purchased or have in your possession because this is the manual that we'll be referencing throughout the presentation and throughout the course as well. Also, um, the features of this lovely manual are it has three categories of medical codes and descriptors or nomenclature or nomenclature, however you choose to say it, as long as you know what you're saying, that's fine with me. Okay nomenclature or nomenclature <laughs> is a different name or descriptor assigned to a person place or thing used by an entity and their affiliates example serial numbers are nomenclature for equipment social security numbers are nom nomenclature see I got myself tripped up for individuals. CPT codes are nomenclature or nomenclature for procedures. Okay, so do you see how that happened? Um, the AMA decided, okay, instead of calling procedures, procedures, we're just going to come up with some codes for those procedures. So a biopsy will be 11000. Okay, I hope it really is because I really don't know what a biopsy is, but I'm guessing it's like in the um, 10,000s. But nonetheless, AMA came up with nomenclature or nomenclature or nomenclature for procedures. Some other features of the book are, th there are three categories, category one codes, category two codes, and category three codes. Um, the category one codes are five digit numeric codes that we've just looked up. Category two codes are performance measurement codes. We'll talk a little more about those in the subsequent um, screens. And category three codes are temporary codes. Those are self-explanatory. All right, let's get to a category one. This is where the majority of the codes live. They are five digit numerical codes. Um, CPT codes are mandatory for coding. Now HICPICS, HICPICS codes, they're level two codes, and these are for Medicare patients. And um, the rule is if there is an applicable HICPICS codes, you use that code in lieu of the code, the CPT code. Okay, so um, there will you will be tested on that on the board exam, and we will go over the common codes that you'll need to use instead of a CPT code. And generally, off the top of my head, I'm going to say. Um, when it comes to injections, you're going to need to use a HICPICS code instead of a CPT code. Some other um, features of Category 1 codes, they have six sections. Um, in those six sections, you have an E&M section, that's evaluation and management, anesthesia, surgery, radiology, pathology, and medicine. That's Category 1. Well, let's move on to Category 2. Category two, they measure performance. So these codes are used to actually measure um, a physician's quality reporting or PQRS. And 
we ask or we are asked to use those codes whenever applicable and commonly when we are to use it you will see the instruction in the parenthetical note that's a note in found within a parentheses so don't worry about it you know don't worry like oh I gotta go find this P you know this this category 2 code no you'll be directed in your parenthetical note when to use it and when you don't need to use it and the way you can recognize a category 2 code is it's a five digit code that ends with the letter F and there's an example there 0001 F and those are your category two codes category three codes these are temporary codes and these are used for emerging technology these are up to five digits end with a T example is 00075 T okay that's not five digits that's six digits and these can be reported separately okay so the main thing that you need to know is that it ends with a T appendices you see my little thumbtack? I think they think I mean appendage or append. No, we're talking about your appendices. They are located in the back of the book right before your um, index. So on the left hand side, you'll see that I've indicated or noted the, app the appendix and on the right, the symbol or the definition. The appendix that have the asterisk next to it these are the ones that are more common that you'll probably need to make friends with um, appendix a these are your modifier definitions and listing it's not anything like on the front cover the inside cover of your CPT manual which houses an abbreviated version of your your modifiers it is more extensive it really defines what that modifier means so if you need clarification on what modifier to use go to appendix a it will definitely um, benefit you or just um, you might even just be comfortable not even going um, you might feel that the presentation on modifiers does it for you so whatever the case you still need to go to appendix a to kind of see what Appendix A can do for you. Appendix B, that is a summary. It houses a summary of all the new codes, all the revised codes, and all the codes that have been deleted. So that's Appendix B, and you'll see my symbols, the red um, dot, as well as the blue triangle, as well as the strike through. In the chapter, you're going to see a red dot next to a code if it is indeed a new code. Appendix C. These are clinical examples of E&M coding. So if you need more examples, you need more practice, go to Appendix C and you'll get some practice questions for E&M. And when we get to the E&M section, that might be valuable for you. But I didn't put a, an asterisk there because it's really not essential that you go there. But just so you know, if you need more clinical examples or practice, go to Appendix C. Appendix D, that's a summary of CPT add-on code listings. And add-on code is denoted by that plus, that broad plus sign. And these codes actually are added on to a another code either a standalone code an indented code or a parent code you add this code on and there are some rules about these add-on codes you can't sequence them first and you never put a 51 modifier on it so if you want to find out where all the add-on codes live and you need a summary of all of them in the book you can go to appendix D appendix E these are modifier 51 exempt codes that means you can't put a modifier 51, which is multiple, a multiple surgery code, a modifier. You, the code cannot have a 51 modifier on it, and you'll see the circle with the slash or the do not um, indicator or symbol. Appendix F, this is a modifier 63 exempt procedure performed on infants less than 4k so that means that you don't 
put a 63 modifier on a particular code and um, you will it will tell you the code usually the parenthetical note will let you know as well appendix G this is CPT codes that include moderate conscious sedation. So it's a whole listing of all codes that have the moderate conscious sedation already bundled into the code. And we'll definitely talk about that a little more. Appendix H, this is alphabetical clinical topics listing that's been removed. All right, you can access the information at the website that's on your screen. Appendices continue. Appendix I is for genetic testing modifiers. J for electrodiagnostic medicine listing of sensory, motor, and mixed nerves. Appendix K, this is important because it's got the asterisk. Um, the product is pending FDA approval. Actually, there's like seven codes in the entire book that have that flash symbol or that flash flash lightning bolt whatever you want to call it but it means that the FDA has not approved the code yet or the procedure or whatever appendix L this is your vascular families listing I love appendix L once you learn how to use appendix L you're gonna get some answers correct on the board exam and it's so easy to do and whenever we get to that um, section in the medicine where you're going to need to know some of the vascular families I'll show you how to use it and you'll be home free appendix M this is renumbered CPT codes and these are citations crosswalk listings um, appendix N is your resequenced CPT codes listing that means that if a code was out of order um, that number or the hashtag sign will direct you and kind of be like a guiding thing for you to to know that hey this is out of order appendix O is multi analyte assays with algorithmic analysis or ma no I'm kidding <laughs> used for clinical laboratories okay I know I botched how to say it I am not the best with enunciation or pronunciation but I try and do my best but it's not something that we'll probably see but you just need to know appendix O houses the ma okay moving right along We've spoken about symbols just because we were reviewing the appendices. The appendices just doesn't house all of the symbols, but that's a big part of it. But let's really talk about um, where we can be um, get the reminders of symbols and what symbols are. And if you look at the picture, look at the screen, you have some symbols at the bottom of the page. And that triangle is for your revised code that red circles new code and those inverted triangles that contains new or revised text and you can't see the slash with the the circle and the slash and that's modifier 51 exempt but nonetheless they're located at the very bottom of your page in CPT so don't feel like oh I've got to remember what they all mean no you don't um, they're on your page almost every single page and you have your little reminder so I am grateful and hopefully you'll appreciate it too so what are we up to now we're gonna review some symbols <laughs> all right we are gonna review because I just wanna know if you remember your symbols first one moderate conscious sedation Bullseye. Boop. I have been deleted. Yes, this has been deleted. So no more. I hate to do this to you. I'm going to do it in red. No more moderate conscious sedation. All right, next. Next a star and we use a star a little black star for telemedicine 
And don't forget, it is used when you have a minimum of audio and visual equipment. Whenever the doctor is performing services and he has to have audio and visual, that means he has to be able to hear you and see you and modifier 95 needs to be appended. All right, this is new for 2017. Okay, new code. We have the red dot. That means the code is new to the CPT manual. So if you look at 20604 with ultrasound guidance with permanent recording and reporting, this is new. So if you open up your 2014 book, you may not have been there. All right. The revised code is symbolized by the blue triangle. And that means that the language was revised or changed. So it's really important when you see these symbols to kind of take heed. If the language was changed, then it could really ultimately impact whether or not you should select that code. Our lightning bolt, the one that only has seven codes in the CPT manual, I've happened to find two of them and on this page where you see the lightning bolt there are actually six lightning bolts. So that is the majority of the codes. And the lightning bolt or the flash means the code is pending until the Food and Drug Administration or FDA approves the procedure. Number or hashtag sign or symbol. That means your code is resequenced or out of order. And as you can see in my example, 95782 is out of order because the, the number that precedes it is 95811 and it's definitely out of order and it should be before. And why they put them out of order? Sometimes they, CPT does that or AMA does that because it makes more sense to put it where they've decided it should go. All right, add on code. Add on code means that you use this code in addition to another code. Remember I said before, never sequence this code first or with modifier 51. The circle with the slash or unwanted symbol means don't append modifier 51 to the code because it is exempt. And this is the modifier 51 exempt code. So don't put that 51 modifier on it. Now on the board exam, do you think you'll see a code like 31500 with a 51 modifier on it in an answer? You sure will. <laughs> they wanna make sure that you know your guidelines, you know your symbols, and you know your rules, and you will. Don't worry, you will know it. Okay, new and revised text, the inverted, inverted triangles. That means that there is new or revised information about the code. Look at our examples. Right above 83993, and actually that applies to 83992, it means phenobarbital, and they, they're telling you if you're trying to code for phenobarbital, use 80345. So you see how important that is. I mean, these notes, and these notes are actually in parentheses. These are parenthetical notes, and it means that it's new. So if you've been coding for a while, and you get a new book, and you see that green, and also green, um, language means that it's new text. So definitely pay attention to it. Recycled code. That's a circle with nothing inside. Okay, a clear circle. I like that better. And it means the code was recycled or reinstated. And no, I couldn't really find any examples because I just didn't have time. But if you see a circle, a clean or clear circle, it's a recycle or reinstated code. 
Okay, so what do you do if you have more than one symbol? All right, we have a bullseye, a bold cross or bold plus sign, and a red circle. We apply them all. Exactly. So when you see those symbols on the side, regardless of how many you see them, they're all applicable. So we have this, we know that 22512 is a moderate conscious sedation code. That means moderate conscious sedation is bundled into the code. The plus tells us that this is an add-on code, so it's not sequence first, nor do we put a 51 modifier on it. And the red dot tells us that this is a new code, so it probably wasn't in your 2014 CPT manual. Okay, last but not least, the green and the red dot with white arrows. Um, these are just CPT publications, and if you need more information about the code, you can reference these publications. So you've got the CPT Assistant and an Insider's View, which is an annual book of all the coding changes for the current year, and that is symbolized by the green dot. And the red dot refers to the quarterly newsletter, and you'll find clinical examples in radiology there. And when you see those dots, the AMA published additional information about the code. We have one more symbol to talk about and that is a semicolon or semicolon. Now, in order for us to understand the role of the semicolon when it comes to coding and the CPT manual, let me explain a little bit about CHUN. Well, CHUN is a CPT annotation technique and it means circle, highlight, underline, and notate. Now here are the players with or in Chun. When you Chun, you need a parent, a parent code. You have an indented code and they make up a family. And if you aren't in the family, you are a standalone code. All right, so the parent code always shares common language with members of the family and members of the family are indented codes. So they share common language, okay? And it is the semicolon that separates the language that's exclusive to that code. So it actually separates the language, the parent language that's exclusive to the parent code. All right, and anything behind the semicolon when you're chunning should be highlighted. All right, let's move on. Okay, let's sum up this semicolon. The semicolon divides the common language portion within a parent code from the specific language. So it divides it. The code specific language in the parent code is interchangeable. Every parent code has a semicolon and every family has a semicolon in it. Got it? I know you do. Sequencing codes and RVUs. 
Yes, we do have to sequence um, CPT codes. And what does sequencing mean? Well, it means when which codes come first in a series. Which codes do you sequence or put first? Just like in ICD-10, ICD-9, ICD-11, the most complex procedure is always sequenced first. So how do we know what's the most complex? By the RVU, of course. What is RVU? RVU is the relative value unit, and the higher the RVU, the more com complex it is, and it's sequenced first. RVU formulas are, are um, produced by um, Medicare, CMS, and if you want to see where they are, you can find it at this web address on the screen. And typically, the codes with the higher RVUs appear after the lower RVUs in CPT. Or maybe I should have said that backwards. Maybe the lower RVUs appear first and the higher RVUs come after. Okay, I like that better. All right, for those of you that need to know, um, this is something you will not be responsible for on, this, on the board exam. However, you may get a question um, re related to how it's coded. So at least you need to know how it's coded. They're not going to ask you to code it, but they may ask you for the formula or something like it. All right, or for those of you that want to know how to actually calculate an RVU, well, you take the work RVUs times the work GP, GPCIs plus the practice expense RVUs times the practice expense GPI, GPCI plus malpractice RVU and malpractice GPCI, and that gives you the total. And RVU total RVU times conversion factor equals the medical Medicare allowable payment. All right, that was a lot to say. I'm not going to say it again. That's the the way that an RVU is calculated. And if you want to know how to calculate it, you just go um, download that, go to that web address that I gave you, download those um, those tables. They're all Excel spreadsheets. And then you'll have to plug in this data. Um, the RVU that you'll data that you'll need from the first list. Um, you go to column F for your work RVUs. You go to column I for your practice expense or your PE RVUs. Um, you go to column K for your malpractice RVUs. You go to column Y for your conversion factor. Um, and then there's another file, zip file, that you have to go to to get your work GPCI. That's in column D. Your expense practice. It's your, your practice expense GPCI, that's in column E, and your malpractice GPCI, that's in column F. So there you got it. For all of you people that need to know, you know now. Okay, so I used this. Um, this is a bad picture too, so maybe I will kind of get it a little more clear by the time you see it hopefully. But nonetheless, we really aren't trying to highlight the verbiage on the page. We're trying to highlight the color scheme going on. And this is how codes are arranged in CPT. First, you have your section. Then underneath the section, you have your subsection, your heading, and your subheading. Your section is in black. Your subsections are in green. Headings, red, and blue are your subheadings and what when we chan we do the notation portion we are documenting the red bold and the blue bold the red bold is your body area and your blue bold is your procedure and that's only applicable to surgery section okay so don't think that's the universal understanding of it but it's common in your surgery section. And this is how it is arranged on the page. And now we just got off of RVU. And I know I don't want to digress, but you know, this is a great opportunity. Um, in your right column, even though you cannot see your codes and how they're lined up, but related codes, particularly codes in a family, the parent code is the, the um, RVU. It's an RVU, but I'm 
which is ironic, it's typically not your higher RVU. The indented codes are the higher RVU because um, they're a little more specific and they take a little more technique. So that is my two cents. Unlisted procedures. We use unlisted procedures when the provider provides a pr procedure or service for which there is no procedure. Often additional notes are provided by the physician to justify using the unlisted procedure code. And these unlisted procedures are often found at the end of the chapter or in the chapter guidelines, the green pages before the codes. And these unlisted procedures, oh, sorry. These unlisted procedures often end with a nine. And at the bottom of your screen, you'll see an example. At the end of the integumentary section, in the breast um, skin section, you see your unlisted procedure code. Parenthetical notes. We've been talking about parenthetical notes. Well, we're going to address it formally now. Parenthetical note is the language found within the parentheses. The importance of reading the notes cannot be overemphasized. You will find a lot of directive in these parenthetical notes, maybe some guideline in the parenthetical notes, and in overall instruction on how to code. Um, on the board exam, I would say about 30% of your answers will come from reading your parenthetical note. So you've got to get in that habit of reading the parenthetical note. Also, for those um, individuals that are taking the CPC uh, exam again, and this is a review for them, I'm willing to bet if you were not in the habit of reading your parenthetical note, that might be singularly the thing that may have cost you from passing. So 30% of the questions coming from the parenthetical note, that's significant. And unless you got 100% on all of your um, other questions, then you could very well maybe not have the outcome that you, you, you desire if you don't read the parenthetical note. And again, always highlight your parenthetical note because highlight means read me read me, read me. Okay, I'm done. Guidelines. There are two type of guidelines, the general chapter guidelines and the specific coding guidelines. The general chapter guidelines are presented at the beginning of each chapter and those are the green pages. Yeah, it's not a great picture, but you can see the color down below on the left hand side. They're your general chapter guidelines. These are jap these are guidelines that apply to the codes in the within the chapter, the majority or some, but they are general guidelines. And then you have then you have code specific guidelines and they come at the beginning of each section. So you can see on the right hand side the debridement section right up underneath debridement the, the subheading you have the guidelines and I highlighted them all in yellow and you shouldn't do that because what yellow is reserved for the Chun families so in parenthetical notes so I just did that I don't know why I use that color well I know why I use that color because that's the only color that we have um, in um, this this program so it won't let me put change the color so just so that you know and just so you can see it, I highlighted it, but you can use a color of your um, choice. And also too, it's not essential to highlight all of it, just highlight what's pertinent. And I will be showing my Chun book. So for those that want to use my um, guideline um, annotations and highlights, feel free. Okay, so this is what guidelines look like. Surgical package guideline. This is just an example of what a guideline would look like, a chapter 
specific guideline. And the reason why I chose surgical package is because this is important. This is something that you need to know. This drives the way you perceive the way you code surgery codes. And surgery, surgery codes, you're going to have 60 surgery codes on the board exam. And that's significant enough for me to, to bring this to your attention. All right. So, so CPT surgical package definition um, is the first part and it's in that little um, inverted triangle and no they're not double so it's not new this is common knowledge but whenever you you perceive a surgery code you need to perceive that that code just doesn't include the surgery it has some other things bundled into it it's got the E&M service the day before surgery, that E&M service is the doctor visit the, the day before, that's bundled in that surgery code. That surgery code also includes any local anesthesia that might not, that may have um, taken place, um, the immediate post-operative care, the writing of the orders, the evaluating the patient post anesthesia, by the physician, not the anesthesiologist, and typical follow-up care. All of that is bundled in that one um, CPT surgical code. So it's important, and the way I knew that is because I looked at the definition. So with that said, that means you don't code a an additional, um, you don't code an additional code for that. So if you have a surgery, um, code, you don't tack on an E&M code, typically, unless you have to. And we're going to talk about some circumstances when you can do that. But typically you don't. You don't um, tack on a local anesthesia and so forth. So there you have it. There's your surgical package guideline and it's presented to you in the green section. And it's, and it's a good example of why you should reference your um, general guideline notes. All right, so let's put our knowledge of CPT symbols and guidelines together, and let's, let's go ahead and do some coding in practice. All right, so remember that we have to use um, steps one through three, the coding steps one through three, and let me remind you that you look up the code in the index, verify the code in the chapter, confirm whether or not guidelines or any directives or directions apply. So because we've got some knowledge of guidelines, let's look up a procedure together. A woman fell to the ground and incurred a wound to the knee. The doctor debrided 15 square centimeters wound down to the subcutaneous level. All right, so this patient fell to the ground, has a wound to the knee, and the doctor debrided a 15 square centimeter wound down to the subcutaneous level. All right, so we're going to locate the procedure, verify the code in the chapter, confirm if it has guidelines or directions. Step one, and as you can see in the upper right hand corner, I left the, def the scenario so that you can reference it if you need it. Step one, I'm going to locate the procedure in the index. And if you look at the bottom, you'll see that I looked up debridement that's our procedure and then if you go down I'm looking for debridement of the skin yeah because we're not debriding anything else I know it's an assumption but if you look up debridement of her knee they may talk about in the if you look up and you see knee and it is right there they're not talking about skin they're talking about like bone stuff and how you know you look at that CPT code that's in the musculoskeletal section and when you're debriding bone and things like that it's a little more intense but no this is debridement of the skin it's an open wound to the knee it's the skin and it's it's a good assumption that you can make so we're going to skin and then underneath skin we're going to the subcutaneous tissue and it drives us to codes 11042 through 11047. So let's take our codes and let's verify our codes in step two. Ha <laughs> 
We did it, we coded. So what next? This is next. You'll give it a try on your own. Here you go, let's go. Question one. A woman fell to the ground and incurred a wound to the knee. The doctor debrided a 15 square centimeter wound down to the muscle. Code the encounter pause this presentation to solve. If you said 11043, you are correct. The wound was debrided down to the muscle. According to guidelines, just under the subheading, sub select the code that codes to the lowest part debrided and that is muscle. Question two. A woman fell to the ground and incurred a wound to the knee. The doctor debrided 40 square centimeter wound down to the muscle, code the encounter. Pause the presentation to solve. If you said 11043 and 11046. You are correct. We looked up the code and it directed us to 11043, debridement of the muscle. We use the same code that we did before. However, the square centimeters of the wound, the, the area of the wound increased and 11043 is for the first 20 square centimeters or less and we've got 40 so we needed to to capture that add-on code and that add-on code is 11046 it says each additional 20 square centimeters or part thereof it means any part thereof it doesn't have to necessarily be an additional 20 square centimeters it can be from zero all the way up to an additional 20 square centimeters. And we know that we're using the correct code. Why? Well, look at that parenthetical note under 11046. It tells you use 11046 in conjunction with 11043. Now, if you got that correct, excellent. Question three, and this is our final question. A 43-year-old patient with a diagnosis of redundant foreskin comes in for a circumcision. The doctor properly prepped, draped, and anesthetized the area and removed the score foreskin using a clamp. What is the proper surgery code? Pause the presentation to solve. If you said 514150 with the 52 modifier, then you are correct. 51450 circumcision using clamp or other device with regional dorsal penal or ring block. All right, this patient had a circumcision. The doctor did not specify the type of anesthesia. So if you look in the parenthetical note, it says do not report modifier 63 in conjunction with this code. All right, that doesn't have anything to do with us because that's for an infant that's 4K or smaller, um, 4KGs, excuse me. But the next parenthetical note does apply to us. It says report 51, excuse me, 54150 with modifier 52 when performed without dorsal penile or ring block. How do we know it's without? Well, simple. The doctor never specified it. And one thing you're going to understand in coding, if it's not written, do not code it. It's that simple. 
So if you got the answer correct, 54150 with a 52 modifier, outstanding. And if you got part of it correct, that's good too. So in time, you will grow accustomed to looking at the parenthetical notes and paying attention to the guideline. All right, we're winding down. And this concludes the presentation. So it's time to start practicing CPT coding. So go ahead and upload your coding sheets.